Okay, I think we've, um, the uh, attendee entrance rate has slowed down, so let's get going. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here uh, for the first of this year's LTER Synthesis webinar series. We're thrilled um, today to have Kate Wilkins talking to you. Um, my name is Jen Cassell, and I'm here with Marty Downs from the LTR Network Office. And um, we are, again, pleased to, um, to, to have you here. What you're looking at um, on the screen is the schedule of all of this session's uh, webinars. They are going to happen on the third Wednesday of every month at this time, which is 11 a.m. Standard, Pacific Standard Time. You all know that because you're here. And you can link to, uh, to register for these webinars um, at our website. And the web links are shown here as well. But it's easiest to just go to the website uh, for the um, LTR office and look in the synthesis area or in the news area. You can register for individual webinars, but you also can register for the entire series. And so that might be easier for you to do. Um, and so getting to uh, getting on with it, first, I want to just say a little bit of housekeeping and then I'll introduce today's speaker. We really encourage you to answer, uh, sorry, to ask questions along the way. And the best way to do that is to use the Q&A function, which you will find on your menu somewhere in your Zoom. It, sometimes it drops down, sometimes it's at the bottom, but it's Q&A. And you can type your questions there. Please note too that you can actually ask them anonymously if you don't want your login name to be shown, that's fine. And a really cool feature of webinar for all of you is if you see a question that you um, really wanna hear answered, you can use the upvote uh, functionality too. So you can just upvote questions. You don't have to you know, type the same exact question over and over again. Um, and um, let's see, so yeah, so use Q&A and upvote, sorry, I lost my screen there for a second. And we will um, have plenty of time at the end uh, for Kate to answer those questions. Um, we will try to watch for the raised hand function as well, but it's harder for us to track that. So we really prefer you use the Q&A. And, um, so, and the final thing is that this uh, webinar is being recorded. And we will eventually get the recording up onto our um, LTR um, office website. And you can see the past webinars at this link that I've shown you on the bottom. So without any further ado, it's just my great pleasure today to introduce Kate Wilkins to you. Um, Kate's a postdoc at Colorado State University. She's a conservation scientist and a community ecologist. And she uses ecology and also science communication to answer really major tricky environmental challenges. Um, at Colorado State, she manages projects that assess how drought affects grassland in the US. And I think we're gonna hear about that today, um, but also globally. And Kate is also particularly interested in research that focus on, focuses on diversity and equity inclusion, especially in academia. So Kate is a co-PI on the LTR synthesis working group that's called a global synthesis of multi-year drought effects on terrestrial ecosystems. Um, and she's running this project with her co-PIs, um, Osvaldo Sala, Peter Wolfart, um, Loriana Girardi, and Melinda Smith. And so let's get started. Um, Kate, I will stop sharing my screen and allow you to share. Great, thanks so much, Jen. And thanks to everyone for being here today. So as Jen mentioned, uh, my name is Kate Wilkins and I am a postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Melinda Smith in the Department of Biology at Colorado State University. And I'm really excited to speak with you all today on behalf of our working group, which has been focused on a global synthesis of multi-year drought effects on terrestrial ecosystems. Global drought is predicted to increase, um, especially with a changing climate. And here we have a map 
depicting uh, areas of the globe that are more wet, represented by greens and blues, and drier areas that are represented by yellows, reds, and purple. Um, and this is a snapshot in time from 2000 to 2009. And over time, we can see that many areas around the globe are becoming much, much drier. And this has consequent economic, social, and ecological consequences. Uh, in terms of the economics, in the US alone, there are annual losses of around 10 to $14 billion, affecting primarily ranching and farming communities that feed populations. In terms of the social effects, there are threats to human health and safety um, with a threat of increasing frequency and uh, uh, intensity of wildfires. And in terms of the ecological consequences, there are damages to structure and function of ecological communities. And our working group is really focused on um, these ecological responses to drought. And in terms of this ecosystem response to drought, in water-limited systems, there have been studies that show no response to drought for biomass, species composition, as well as species richness and density. However, there have been other studies that show with lower mean annual precipitation, as well as smaller rainfall event sizes, there is an increase in the drought response of certain ecosystems. Thus, some systems seem to be resistant to drought, whereas other systems seem to be responding to drought. And so it's really important to improve information on ecosystem response to drought. Um, currently, there seems to be a lack of coordinated experiments uh, across a large network of sites. So it would be important to, uh, that would be a key factor, um, as well as across dif different ecosystems. And most experiments currently vary in their timing, lasting um, anywhere from one to 11 years. So we need consistent longer term research. And uh, many experiments have also not implemented an extreme drought, which is what's predicted to happen in the future. And that was the uh, inspiration for the formation of DroughtNet which was funded in 2013 by the National Science Foundation as a research coordination network. And it, uh, the steering committee is comprised of people from 14 universities across seven different countries. And as part of DroughtNet, there is the International Drought Experiment with the goal of understanding how terrestrial ecosystems may differ in their response to extreme drought and then to use that data from the network to help land managers, such as those that are managing long-term ecological research sites to adapt to and prepare for extreme drought. And when we say extreme drought, I'll, I'll define that climate extreme for you here. So there's the historic distribution of climate parameters. And for the purposes of our research, extreme drought would entail a statistically rare or unusual occurrence with respect to that historic distribution. And so to participate in the international drought experiment, sites had to implement that extreme drought, which for us was a one in 100 year event, and submit at least four years of data and provide data on above ground net primary production, plant species composition, temperature, uh, precipitation, as well as soil nutrients and texture. And people who are interested in participating could find guidelines and protocols on the DroughtNet website, um, everything from how to collect the vegetation data to how to build shelter, the drought shelters, as well as data te templates for submitting the data to us once they had collected it. In addition, uh, we provided uh, participants with a terrestrial precipitation analysis package. And specifically, they could use a precipitation manipulation tool. Um, and it would allow sites to input annual or monthly precip precipitation records to determine how much they actually needed to uh, reduce rainfall to achieve the desired extreme event. Um, and 
yeah, I'll leave it at that. But it was a really useful tool for helping sites be able to determine what amount they actually needed to reduce precipitation by. And I'm excited to say that uh, we have over uh, 130 sites, so 135 sites across six continents, almost all the continents. We don't have Antarctica yet uh, or ever. Uh, and uh, they represent uh, not only um, part of our network, but there are 12 sites that are long-term ecological research sites. Um, in addition, we have four sites that are international long-term ecological research stations. And we have a range of site characteristics um, across uh, elevation, temperature, and precipitation gradients. In addition, I'd like to point out that the amount that sites reduce precipitation varied, so um, anywhere from 20 to 95%. And again, it was based on the long-term historic record for each site. Um, so uh, it was catered to each site, we didn't mandate you know, a certain level of precipitation that they needed to reduce it by because we wanted it to be able to vary based on um, what made sense for the site. Uh, in addition, the years that uh, this has taken place uh, from 2010 to 2020, just some sites uh, maybe started a little bit early, but most sites began in 2015. And uh, most sites also have sent uh, one to three years of treatment data, and we're still waiting on a few, uh, a last few sites to send in their final fourth year of data. Now I'll discuss our first analysis in which we synthesize data from one year of extreme drought. And to understand ecosystem response to drought, we used uh, above ground net primary production as our metric uh, because of its importance in the global carbon cycle and it's easy to standardize across sites. And um, our initial question was, how do ecosystems respond to one year of extreme drought globally? And we wanted to focus on one year because one year droughts tend to have the highest occurrence globally across different ecosystem types. Um, and in addition, this is, uh, we had the most information from the most sites uh, for one, one year. Um, and despite the uh, frequent occurrence of one year of drought globally, we don't know as much about the effects of one year of drought on terrestrial ecosystems. So uh, we first wanted to understand this, this mean effect and then um, if there was any variation among sites within the network, we wanted to understand which factors might be contributing to this variation. And uh, for the methods for this, uh, in terms of the shelter design, uh, we asked sites to have a, a target minimum of a shelter size between two meters long to two meters wide. However, the size did vary based on site attributes. Um, and those shelters consisted of metal or, or wood support infrastructure um, with clear V-shaped plastic uh, or corrugated polycarbonate. And this shelter design um, has been shown to have similar effects on key drought characteristics, uh, such as number of consecutive days, size of events, and number of events. Um, as naturally occurring extreme dry years across a range of ecosystems. And for the biomass collection, uh, this was measured annually, either destructively or non-destructively, and then separate, separated into live and dead categories. And then the live categories were further classified as grasses, forbs, or woody plants. And I'll just, go through quickly what happens once we get that raw data from the sites. Um, the experiments seem to be the part that is, uh, it's, it's challenging, but potentially easier to implement than the actual data management side. And so we get the raw data and bring it into MySQL. And thankfully the uh, structured query language that we're using was all, uh, the code for that was set up by the nutrient network. So we already had that structure in place, uh, and that was really helpful for being able to standardize plant species 
um, within the database. And then we output the clean data, clean quote unquote data that then has some further processing within our studio uh, before outputting a final product that can be used for analysis. And into the results now. So for this first analysis, while we do have 135 sites that are in the network, um, we could only look at 95 sites because we had certain inclusion criteria that were we were using for this uh, first set of analyses. The main one being that sites had to submit data on above ground net primary production for both drought and control plots um, and with the drought having to last for one year. And so we have 95 sites that we were able to include and um, a nice distribution of sites across the globe and across a mean annual temperature and precipitation gradient. And the ecosystems that we're focused on also for this analysis include grasslands and shrublands. And for the remainder of the talk, grasslands will be represented by the green circle and shrublands will be represented by the tan triangle. And I'd also like to reiterate that the amount that sites reduce precipitation within their drought plots varied, uh, again, based on that historic distribution of uh, precipitation with, with, for that site. Um, most sites did end up reducing precipitation by around 50%, but then it varied. And overall, we did see uh, a decline in above ground net primary production in the drought plots um, and also uh, a reduction not only overall but also within grasslands and shrublands and um, our drought response here is on the x-axis and for drought response we calculated that as the natural log of above ground net primary production in the drought plots divided by above ground net primary production in the control plots. And while we did see, um, oh, also, um, so zero here represents no change in above ground net primary production um, in drought versus control plots, whereas uh, the negative numbers indicate that there was a loss in ANPP. And so while we did see this overall mean effect uh, we did see a lot of variation when we looked at the mean effects by site. Um, and again, we have a drought response here on the x-axis, and then the sites are that we were able to include for this analysis are listed on the y-axis. And so we see this variation, and we started to ask what might be contributing to this. And I'd uh, like to highlight that the shelters that people were using were passive shelters. And so while the target was a one in 100 year drought, um, since the years are passive shelters, we wanted to see uh, how much drought severity truly varied among the sites. Um, even though the target was meant to be the same, uh, some sites might have ended up uh, below that target and some above. And so we wanted to ask, how does drought severity uh, potentially contribute to the variation that we're seeing in that drought response across those sites? And so um, I will walk through this graph with you all, um, but first I'd like to mention that we had additional criteria here uh, that sites needed to meet, thus we were only able to incorporate 82 sites uh, into this analysis. Um, and for this, we tested both linear and nonlinear models, and they weren't different according to AICC, so we went with the linear model. Uh, on the x-axis here, we have drought severity, which we calculated as uh, the precipitation and the drought plots minus mean annual precipitation, and then divided by mean annual precipitation. So it's a percent deviation in um, precipitation in the drought plots from mean annual precipitation. And on the y-axis, again, we have drought response, which is the same um, as the previous slide. And um, for the purple dots that you see, or, or fuchsia, you might call them, um, these represent average drought response for sites with 
ambient precipitation that was either above mean annual precipitation represented by the square um, or average drought response for sites with ambient precipitation that was below mean annual precipitation, which is represented by the diamond. And uh, the red dotted lines um, indicate uh, a mean loss in ANPP, uh, so either 50% loss or 75% loss in above ground net primary production. And so we do see a, a significant um, effect or relationship between drought severity and drought response. And as you get more extreme, um, you do see larger drought responses. Uh, however, uh, we only saw around three sites that experienced catastrophic losses um, in above ground net primary production. So greater than 75% loss. Uh, in addition to looking at drought severity, uh, we also wanted to understand how certain um, biotic and abiotic factors potentially contributed to uh, the drought response. And so we also looked at um, mean annual precipitation, uh, the percent of sand at the site, as well as the average, average proportion of graminoids. And we didn't see um, any significant relationship in these factors um, and their effect on drought response. So uh, in conclusion, from this controlled experiment with people from all over the world trying to implement the same level of drought, we found uh, that one year of drought did reduce annual net primary pr productivity and had a similar mean effect to that of a meta-analysis, which included um, 119 sites around the globe. Um, and this meta-analysis actually combined data from droughts that varied in duration and extremity. And so um, while we observed a mean decline, we did find a, consider a considerable amount of variation underlying that mean effect. And drought severity really emerged as the key factor in predicting that variation. And while the relationship um, between drought response and severity um, is linear, this suggests that the more severe the drought is, the greater the loss in production. But ultimately, we didn't see catastrophic losses um, with, you know, there weren't that many sites that were below that 75% um, mark um, indicating um, that loss, that 75% loss in ANPP. So yeah, we just didn't observe that with this first year of extreme drought. And in terms of our next steps, we're really interested in understanding the relationship between species composition and plant production. And so the expectation is that while severity is important in explaining variation, um, as we look across four years of data, time might become the greater factor in affecting production because over time, species composition is likely to be more affected, um, which will in turn affect production. So here we see that there um, might be a weak relationship uh, between species composition and ANPP in that first year. And then again, in later years, um, we might see that relationship become stronger. And so our initial approach to understand this involves um, structural equation modeling but what's really great about working um, as part of NCs is learning about other approaches that we could use for this data. So I'd be really excited to hear uh, other people's thoughts on this and any suggestions y'all might have. And so um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our different funders, the Powell Center, uh, NCs LTR Synthesis Grant, uh, USDA NEPA's Postdoctoral Fellowship Grant, um, as well as NFF, NSF's Research Coordination Network Grant. Um, and with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Kate. Um, really appreciate that. Very interesting. You do have some questions rolling in. You yourself can see the Q&A, but I can also just read them for you if that's easier. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, and and then, sharing unless people want to see another slide. Yeah, well, if it, yeah, here come a, a whole bunch of questions. I guess if folks want to see a particular slide or or if you need to go back to a slide, Kate, just reshare when um, if you need to. Okay, so the yeah. first question is from either Janice or Janice Grow. And the question is, and this one came in during your methods, I know, did you also look at below ground biomass production? No, we we did not look at that. And I'm, I'm not sure, um, there might be a few sites that have collected that data and we just don't know about it. I know that there are some other um, side projects that are planning to look at microbial communities um, in drought versus control plots, but I don't think, yeah, nobody's looked at below ground production specifically to my knowledge. Great, thanks. And if folks, um, you know, do know of other projects or other things going on, um, you know, feel free to throw those in the chat as well or um, raise your hand. We do actually have plenty of time, so we could in fact get into a conversation. Okay. Um, thanks. So the next question is, were there similarities found? Uh, I'm sorry, they, the questions move sometimes as I'm reading them. So that one jumped. Uh, were there similarities between the sites that did experience um, catastrophic loss in production? And I'm not. Yeah, sure. I would have to look again at which sites those are exactly, but I believe that they were in um, prior climates. And, and we did have quite a spread of sites. Not all of the sites in drier climate, climates experienced that catastrophic loss, um, but from what I recall, those sites were generally in drier areas. Okay, great. Um, okay, um, do drought net experiments incorporate tests of any particular management strategies? Uh, I need some clarification on what is meant by management strategies and testing? Okay, so um, I, I don't know either, but um, an anonymous attendee who questioned, the question was, do drought net experiments incorporate tests of any particular management strategies? Pop back on the Q&A and, um, and maybe clarify that for Kate and we'll circle back to that. Or um, raise your hand, as I said, and we are trying to track that as well and we can discuss. So we will keep that one live. Um, okay, here's a question from Cameron McIntyre. Was mean annual temperature found to be an important covariate among sites that had significant de declines in ANPP? Hmm. Um, I don't recall if we looked at mean annual temperature as one of our covariates. It did, um, I'm thinking back to all of the yeah analyses that we did, and I believe that mean annual temperature was highly correlated with mean annual precipitation, and so I I don't think we ended up including that, um, and we just used mean annual precipitation, if I recall. So no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Amy Hudson asks. Um, was there a spatial component for participants in the in drought net? For example, maybe did it need to cover X kilometer squared to be included? Um, and I'm going to just tack on a second question as well, Kate, that's sort of similar um, from McKinley Nevins, which is, so were most of the participants in this drought net experiment already research sites, or could anyone establish sites to participate in the experiment? Could you share a bit more about what it was like to work with so many different groups to make this work? So two questions about how do you get to be part of drought net? Were there qualifications yeah. in, in your site? Were, were they already existing? Can people sign up? Blah, 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 on and on. Yeah, great, great questions. So uh, I'll answer the size one first. Um, really, sites just had to implement the shelter. I don't think that we had a size uh, requirement in terms of you know how many shelter. Well, yeah, we did. You know, sites had to have um, I think at least uh, three control and three drought plots. But then in terms of the actual space where they set those up, I don't. I don't believe that we had uh, a size requirement for that. And then in terms of who could participate, and anyone, if you had land where you could construct shelters and meet all of the other requirements in terms of being able to implement it for four years, um, have uh, 
you know, drought shelters built, you could, you could participate in it. So, um, yeah, you didn't have to be an existing research site, but that's probably easier because it's hard to find land to build these longer term experiments. Great, thanks, Kate. Um, okay, another question. Um, is there ongoing or collaborative ecosystem modeling for these particular experiments so that we can try to improve model simulation of drought? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, we're still in the process of, of, of trying to analyze some of this data, especially over the longer term. So in, in that sense, I would say that within our group, we are, we have an ongoing collaboration for trying to model some of this. Yes. And, and we're always open to, to new ideas of, of better ways that we could be doing that too. That's what I kind of mentioned at the end there with our next steps and the trying to do that structural equation modeling. Um, we haven't even started that yet. So uh, we think that's the best approach, but we're not quite certain. So if people on the call have other ideas about that, that would be great to hear. Right, yeah, and there's there's a few um, comments in the chat already um, from folks who, who know of other um, experiments going on or, okay, so, um, Kate, I'd like to get back to the um, question about management strategies, particular management strategies at the site, and our attendee has clarified um, and, and writes, you mentioned the potential for the project to inform drought adaptation. So do any of the experiments test these kinds of strategies, like along with simulating drought? So for example, plots oh, with different gotcha. seed mixes or diversity. Does yeah. that clarify better, Kate? Yes, yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, that's sort of where I was thinking, but then I didn't want to dive into that if that's not what you meant, um, anonymous person. Here. <laughs> anonymous attendee. <laughs> yeah, anonymous attendee. Uh, yeah, so as part of, um, we we do not, we don't have that uh, implemented. We're, we're just focusing on, on drought for this. Uh, however, we, we hope that whatever information we do have on drought can um, then be used to help inform um, how, like for grazing plans, for example, um, if we demonstrate that um, for our site in particular, it's the short grass step um, out here in Colorado. It's quite dry. We did see our sites was one of those ones that did experience those catastrophic losses. And I think that that would be really important information to provide to the land managers out there um, who are leasing this land to, to livestock owners who are grazing their cattle. Um, just, you know, there might not be a lot, if we had an extreme drought, there wouldn't be a lot of production out there for the cattle to feed on. So they might wanna reconsider stocking densities in that case. Um, I am personally very interested in studying that intersection between grazing and drought and trying to implement. I know uh, people are starting to do this um, at the Kanza LTER, looking at um, the interaction of grazing and drought and seeing what happens. Uh, but within our network, people have only submitted information on drought and, and not the interaction of those different management strategies. Great question. Oops, I'm muted. You can see my mouth moving, but nothing coming out. Um, so that was a great question as well. That's what I was saying. Um, yeah. Okay, so another question. Um, have you checked whether the response to drought is somehow related to soil properties? Yeah, so that was um, our intention with looking at the percent sand. Um, we felt like that would be uh, a main soil property indicating, you know, how much water is actually being retained within the soil. Uh, that's that's really the only soil property we've looked at thus far. We'd like to look at other ones. We've had um, a subset of sites that were able to submit um, soil information. Um, so yeah, that is something that we would like to look into more. Um, and we have uh, our our initial look into that again was with that percent sand. Great. 
Kate, there's two questions that are sort of methodological about the experiments. The first is from Andrew, which is, um, is more analytical, but did you ever put the drought severity in terms of precipitation percentiles? Andrew's thinking that with passive rainfall reduction shelters, that the actual precipitation percentile that got into the shelters, right, might be different than the original target percentile. And Andrew says, sorry if I missed this, nice job. And then We'll, we'll let you get to that, but then there's a second question as well, just about the drought treatment structures themselves and how they affect light, nutrients, and temperature, and would there be heterogeneity across the sites for this? So first, passive precip precipitation in these from these structures, um, and then secondly, heterogeneity across the sites. Yeah, maybe I'll... Um... Maybe I'll answer the second question first because I think I need you to re-ask the percentiles question. Okay, that's um, fine. I'm sorry if I'm loading this up. And you can read these as well, Kate. So Patrick okay. Thomas asks, how do the drought treatment structures affect light nutrients and temperature? And is there heterogeneity across the sites for this? Yeah. So I think he's asking well, heterogeneity in the structure, in how the structure acts, but yeah. So um I know that there was a study, one of our one of the sites that participates in the network at, at UC Santa Cruz looked actually looked at some of these features uh, within or underneath their own drought structures and found that um, it wasn't really affecting uh, light nutrients and temperature. I, I believe it was some of those factors um, actually within the drought structure versus uh, open air plots. So uh, demonstrating that these really are passive shelters that aren't affecting um, some of those other variables that much. I can't say that that's the case across all of these sites, but I also know that with, with these shelters, um, I think that, that that's been demonstrated in other studies as well. But it would be interesting to see how shelters across different sites uh, may, may differ in that. But thus far, there is evidence to suggest that uh, the shelters, again, aren't affecting some of those like microclimates underneath. Uh, I will look at the second question again, or the- Yeah, the, the second was um, from Andrew Felton. You can read it. Oh, if, hi, Andrew. Yeah, <laughs> putting Andrew. the, you know, classifying the drought severity maybe into precipitation percentiles thinking mm. that the actual precipitation percentile that gets into the shelters through passive rainfall, um, I'm sorry, because they're passive reduction shelters could be different than what you're targeting. So yeah. Um, so yeah, we haven't, we haven't done it in terms of precipitation percentiles, but I will say that I think that that's why what we were trying to get at with the drought severity metric to see if sites actually um, created as severe of a drought as we were intending, which was that one in 100 year event. But, but no, we have not done it specifically looking at what percentile they fell into. Great, thanks. And I just wanna point everybody to the chat as well. Some references are going up there that are pertinent to the discussion and you all should have mm -hmm. access to that, so. Yeah, great, thanks, Jake, yeah. for posting that. Great, okay. A um, couple more questions coming in. Um, we have a question here. How long, um, how long did the effects of extreme drought last in the analysis? Within a year, several years, or even longer? Yeah, so for this first analysis, uh, we were just looking at one year of extreme drought. And um, in terms of the specifics of that, uh, the sites had to have submitted um, at least, there had to have been at least 120 days of drought. So that would have been, um, you know, equivalent to a, a growing season. Uh, and then uh, no more than, um, I, I wanna say it was, yeah, it had to be less than two years. Um, so that was kind of like our one year metric. So not multiple years. Oh, great. Hope, these are, hope I'm answering everyone's questions. <laughs> oh, I think you are. Um, otherwise, people would be typing in, wait, I didn't understand that answer, and they're not. Yeah, so. yeah great. 
Um, okay, great. And I'm just sorry, I'm uh, multitasking here, sending that reference uh, to Patrick in direct uh, answer to his question. Um, okay, the last question from Maggie Anderson, and this has been sitting in the Q&A for a while here, so thanks, Maggie. Um, great talk. You mentioned the graminoids, but have you observed any changes in um, the leguminous versus the long, sorry, non-leguminous forb responses to drought? Uh, we have not looked at that yet. We, yeah, that's, there's uh, so much that we could do with this data set and we're really excited about um, the prospects of, of looking into different analyses and different ways that we could uh, assess how drought is affecting these ecosystems. And, and so we do have that information, like it'd be possible to do that analysis, but we haven't done that yet. So that's a great question. If you're interested in that, talk to us about using our data. Yeah, please talk to Kate and her colleagues because this yeah. is one of the reasons why we're so excited about this webinar series to to get everybody here from both within the LTR community and outside the LTR community as well to start these conversations. Um, that's the last of the questions, Kate, and I don't see any raised hands as e uh, either. So I think um, with that, oh, one more question. Um, and we will make this the last one from Robert Griffin Nolan. You can see it. Uh, Hi, do you know how many drought net <laughs> sites are also nut net sites? Okay, Kate, pull that out of your database in your head. How many exactly? Oh my goodness. So uh, we do, it's, it's interesting because we have, we have uh, my counterpart at the University of Minnesota is working on the intersection between drought net and nut net sites. Uh, so his name's Peter. He would know that off the top of his head. Um, off the top of my head, I would say that there are maybe 20 sites around there, if not more. So yeah, there is quite a bit of overlap with those two. Great. Um, thanks. So again, okay, so to close this out, please, please get on um, the website and register for the series. We're going to meet here um, at this time next month, time and day. Um, Marty, would you like to close us out and mention about where these recordings will go or anything else about um, about the ser webinar series? Absolutely. Uh, the whole series of recordings will go up within uh, a couple of days after the, each of the, the talks, and those will be available on the um, LTER Network YouTube site, which is just USLTER. Search for that once you get into YouTube. Uh, they'll also be linked from the um, from the same page where you registered. Um, and I did want to plug before we go that uh, the network office will be hiring a postdoc to uh, to add support to our current working groups. That um, that opportunity is also live on the LTER network website, which is LTERnet.edu. So help us spread the word on that. Right, and that, uh, and that um, opportunity will be closing pretty soon. So yeah. spread the Close word fast the the and have your folks who are looking for postdocs, um, you know, get in there and, and apply. Um, okay, so really finally, I would just like to thank Kate so much and your co-authors and your co-PIs on the, the um, LTR Synthesis Working Group, Kate, for taking this time this morning. Really, really appreciated. Um, amazing work. Yeah, thank you all so much. And I also just put my uh, email address in the chat in case anybody had questions that they uh, didn't feel comfortable asking or yeah, if they think of a question later, please feel free to email me. Um, and if you're also interested in, in working with the data set, we can talk about that too. Great, and lots of thank yous are rolling in on the chat, um, Kate, from the participants. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much everyone. Okay, great.